Good morning. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We had uh, just finished the uh, discussion of the legislative branch of the government in the uh, part three of the uh, discussion. So uh, we will now be going to part four. Part four of the uh, discussion uh, refers to the, uh, we will just be discussing the executive and the uh, judicial branches of the government. To start with, <clears throat> we will be going to the executive branch of the government, which is uh, stated under Article 7 of the 1987 Constitution, as uh, stated in uh, uh, Section 1 of uh, Article 7 of the Constitution, the uh, executive power shall be vested in the President of the Philippines. So the executive power is the uh, power to enforce the law, which shall be vested, I repeat, in the President of the Philippines. If you can still recall our discussion in the case of Blas Ople versus Ruben Torres, this involves the act of President Fidel Ramos in issuing Administrative Order uh, 308, way back 1996. So Administrative Order 308 is uh, entitled Adoption of a National Computerized Ad Identification Reference System. So the main issue in this case is, may the president issue an administrative order that will affect the uh, life and liberty of every Filipino citizen. So according to the Supreme Court, the president cannot do that. An administrative order that uh, will affect the life and liberty of every Filipino citizen is a form of law, wherein the law must be uh, uh, created or it must be made by the legislative branch of the uh, government and not the executive branch. There are several changes that were introduced by the 1987 Constitution compared to the uh, 1973 or 1935 Constitution, and this include the following. First, the Vice President may be appointed as a member of the Cabinet, and such appointment requires no confirmation from the Commission on Appointments, Second is uh, the rule on succession if who will become the uh, uh, president in case of his disqualification or inability. So we will be discussing this one by one later on. There is a special quotation or a special knowledge in relation to the president's immunity from suit. The uh, president's immunity from suit was introduced considering the fact that there are several jobs that must be accomplished by the president. His attention must be undivided. Dahil sa dami ng ginagawa ng ating presidente, hindi dapat uh, nahahati ang kanyang attention. Because if we will be allowing the president to be sued, then our president will be doing his job as a president. At the same time, he is facing the charges that is being filed against him or her. Comes now the case of uh, Sullivan versus Makashar. <clears throat> uh, what happened in this case? President Corazon Aquino uh, sued Luis Beltran, Manu, uh, si Luis Beltran ay manunulat ng uh, uh, star. 
uh, uh, Star newspaper. Sinulat kasi ni uh, Luis Beltran na nung uh, pinasahog ang uh, Malacanang, si President Aquino ay nagtago daw sa ilalim ng kanyang kama. So uh, because of that, President Aquino uh, sinampahan niya ng kasong libel si Beltran. Ang isa sa depensa ni Beltran ay uh, unfairness. According to Beltran, the president cannot be sued. Yan ang tinatawag natin na immunity from suit, the, the president's immunity from suit. So it is unfair kung ang president na hindi pwedeng kasuhan ay pwede siyang magsampa ng kaso. So the issue is, if the president cannot be sued, pwede ba siyang magsampa ng kaso? So ano sabi ng Supreme Court? Yes. The president cannot be sued, pero pwede siyang magsampa ng kaso. So the privilege of immunity from suit pertains to the president by virtue of the office and may not be invoked and may be invoked only by the president himself and it cannot be invoked by other persons. So let's go to the qualifications of a person to become president. So first of the qualifications is he must be natural born citizen. We had discussed uh, in the previous uh, part of our discussion that there are two cl uh, classifications of citizens of the Philippines. First, the natural born citizens. These are citizens, citizens of the Philippines from birth without having to perform an act to acquire or perfect Philippine citizenship. And second is those who are naturalized in accordance with law. So another qualification is he must be a registered voter, able to read and write, at least 40 years of age on the day of the election, and uh, a resident of the Philippines at least 10 years immediately preceding the day of election. So we had also discussed the case of Fernando Po. In a case entitled Texon versus Kamelec, wherein if a child is an illegitimate child and his mother is a foreigner and his father is a Filipino, he cannot be disqualified to run as president because to disqualify an illegitimate child from holding an important public office is to punish him from indiscretion of his parents. Hindi naman niya kasalanan kung bakit siya naging illegitimate. So we had discussed that before. Here is the list of the past up to the present, uh, present uh, presidents of the Republic of the Philippines. So we all know that the first uh, president of the Republic of the Philippines is uh, Emilio Aguinaldo. And uh, at present, our uh, president is uh, Rodrigo Duterte, who was uh, elected as such way back uh, June 30, 2016. And uh, he will be finishing his uh, term by June 30, 2022. The qualifications of a person to run as president is the same with the qualification of a person to run as vice president. So uh, we will be discussing first the powers of the vice president. Afterwards, later on, we will be discussing the president. Under the constitution, there are two things that the president may perform. So first is he will act 
as the president in case of temporary incapacity of the president and in case that the president will have permanent incapacity like resignation or death then the vice president will become the president and second is the vice president may be appointed as member of the cabinet and such appointment needs no confirmation from the commission on appointments to tell you there must be something that must be done in the position of the vice president if time will come that the 1987 constitution will be amended then it is better for the vice president either to tanggalin na lang isn't it tanggalin na lang or to give additional uh, job or additional functions or powers so that at least the uh, Philippines will be maximizing that position instead of uh, uh, instead na hinihintay ang incapacity ng ating president o hinihintay na siya ay ma-appoint na cabinet member. So, is the president eligible for election? To tell you no. This is the distinction between the 1935 Constitution and the 1987 Constitution. Under the 1940 Amendment to the 1935 Constitution, the term of office of the president shall be four years, but capable of re-election once. But in the 1987 Constitution, the president is incapacitated for re-election. So, how about in the case of Vice President GMA, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo? How come that she became the President of the Republic of the Philippines for nine years? What happened? No? What happened in, this, in the case of GMA? So, these are the facts about the presidency of... Uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. JMA was elected as a vice president and uh, Estrada as the president way back 1998. And both of them will be finishing their term by 2004. Things became complicated, however, on the part of President Estrada because he resigned. Okay? I repeat, uh, according to the Supreme Court, Estrada resigned on uh, January 20, 2001. So by operation of the constitution, the president will, uh, the vice president will become the president in case that the president will resign. So starting January 20, 2021, up to June 30, 2004, GMA became the president for a span of three years, five months, and ten days because of the rule on succession. So I repeat, naging presidente siya ng three years, five months, and ten days dahil siya ang vice president ng time na nag-resign ang ating president. So, he ran as uh, he ran and won in the uh, May 10, 2004 election as president. So, nadagdagan ng six years. So, all in all, GMA served as the president of the Republic of the Philippines for nine years, five months, and ten days without violating the 1987 constitution. So, why is it that without violating the 1987 uh, constitution, that is because the Constitution provides that the president is not eligible for election. But how come that yun nga, nag exceed ng six years ang kanyang term? That is because, I repeat, the three years, five months, and 20 days was, she was not elected for that as a president. She only 
uh, serve the remaining term of office of President Estrada. So, <clears throat> how come that President uh, Arroyo was qualified to run way back 2004? That is because under the Constitution, if a person has succeeded as president and has served as such for more than four years, he shall not be qualified for election to the same office at any time. See, President GMA, nung naging president siya upon the resignation of Joseph Estrada, she, di she did not complete the four years as such because of the succession. Kulang ng four years. Okay? Ang kanyang uh, <clears throat> presidency nung pinalitan niya si Estrada. So, paano kung napaaga ang resignation ni Estrada ng one year? So, President Arroyo already became the president for more than four years nung nag-resign si Estrada. Qualified pa ba siya na, na tumakbo during the 2004 presidential election? To tell you, hindi na siya qualified. Because I repeat, according to the Constitution, kung nag-serve siya ng higit sa four years, hindi na siya qualified na tatakbo na president way back 2004 election. It happened that hindi niya nakompleto yung four-year requirement na yun. How about President Marcos? How come that he became the President of the Republic of the Philippines for 21 years from 1965 to 1986? So these are the facts about the presidency of uh, Ferdinand Marcos. The uh, constitution that is prevailing during that time when president was elected, uh, when uh, Marcos was uh, elected as president way back 1965 and 1969 is the 1935 constitution. Originally, the 1935 constitution prohibits the re-election of the president. And the term of office of the president way, uh, during that time is six years with and incapable of re-election. It only happened that way back 1940, there was an amendment to the 1935 constitution stating that the, pre the term of office of the president shall be only four years and he is capable of re-election once. So, with respect to Marcos, he was elected as president for the first time in 1965. So, yun, he won in the uh, 1965 uh, presidential election, and in 1969, he again won. So, patapos ang kanyang term as president way back, ay, uh, by 1973. No? Patapos na sana ang kanyang term way back uh, 1973. It only happened that in 1972, he declared martial law. And in 1973, he changed the constitution. So things became complicated therein. So that is the main reason why he became president until 1986. Okay, He was only uh, removed after El Sawan revolution in, I repeat, 1986. How about with respect to the vice president? Is he or is she eligible for election to tell you yes? The president is eligible for re-election once, okay? Once only. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's go to the case of Fernando Po. Junior versus GMA. <clears throat> what happened in this case? Way back 2004 election, <clears throat> uh, Fernando Po Jr. also filed his certificate of candidacy to Makbusha. Kaya nga nagkaroon ng Texan versus Kamelec. 
nanalo siya sa kanyang citizenship. And of course, James A. also ran for the same position. After the uh, election, uh, James A. was declared as the winner, but there was uh, an election protest that uh, was filed by Fernando Po. So sa kasamang palad, way back uh, December 10, 2004, Fernando Po died. <clears throat> so uh, because of the death of uh, Fernando Po, his wife by the name of uh, Susan Roses sought for an intervention or substitution. Sabi ng kanyang misis, ipagpapatuloy ko yung uh, election protest na sinampan ng aking mister. So uh, the issue here is, pwede bang palitan ni Susan Roses ang, uh, elect uh, ang kanyang mister sa election protest na finale ni Fernando Po pagkatapos na mat nung namatay si Fernando Po. No? So the Supreme Court said no. This is because in the rule on the uh, uh, Presidential Electoral Tribunal, only the registered candidate for president or vice president of the Philippines who received the second and third highest number of votes may contest the election of the president and uh, vice president. The rules on the Presidential Electoral Tribunal does not provide for any uh, substitution or intervention. Okay, so in other words, nung namatay si uh, Fernando Po na nag-file ng, uh, ng uh, protest, ay uh, pati ang kanyang protest ay namatay din. Okay, no one can substitute, can substitute on his behalf already. So we will be going to the rules that must be considered in filling up the vacancy of the position of the president. So these are the rules. If the president-elect fails to qualify, the president-elect shall act as a president until such time that the president-elect shall be qualified. Next, if the president shall not have been chosen, the vice president-elect shall act as the uh, president until such time that the president shall have been chosen and qualified. If at the beginning of the term of the president, the president-elect shall have died or shall have become permanently disabled, then the president-elect shall become the president. Where no president and vice president shall have been chosen or shall have qualified, or where both shall have died or become permanently disabled, then the president of the Senate, or in case of the inability of the president of the Senate, the Speaker of the House shall act as a president until a president or vice president shall have been chosen and qualified. So in other words, there is a rule on succession that we must consider here. Kung wala ang president, then the president will act as a president. Kung wala yung dalawa, then it is the, uh, it is the uh, Senate president. Kung wala yung tatlo, then it is a speaker of the House. Uh, kung wala yung apat, then it will be the Congress who will decide. Paano kung pati ang Congress wala din? So, uh, surely it will uh, create a constitutional crisis. That is because the Constitution does not provide for a remedy for such instance. The case of uh, Estrada versus Deserto 
is a very unique case because <clears throat> there are several complicated things that happen here wherein ibang alam ng mga tao, ibang dineclare ng Supreme Court, so on and so forth. During the time of Estrada, <clears throat> nagkaroon tayo ng Edsa II Revolution wherein uh, there was an attempt to uh, unseat o tanggalin si uh, Estrada. So sabi ng iba, nagtagumpay yon kasi umalis si Estrada. But sabi naman ng Supreme Court, no, hindi umalis si Estrada. Si Estrada ay nag-resign. So, according to the actuations of Estrada during that time now, he is deemed to have resigned. No? And that is what we call the totality test if you will be combining all what he did during af uh, immediately after the Edsa II revolution, sabi ng Supreme Court, nag-resign siya. But sabi ni Estrada, I'm only on leave. Okay? So, he's only on leave. So, pwede bang pagbigyan yung sinabi niya na he's only on leave? Okay? So, after the... Uh, <clears throat> after the uh, uh, decision of the Supreme Court, the, uh, the Supreme Court decided that he resigned. He was not on leave. So you may ask, ano ba kasing nangyari doon? What happened during that case? <clears throat> it all started when uh, Chavit Simpson, a long-time friend of uh, Estrada, <clears throat> ay bumaliktad. Bumaliktad kay Estrada. Sabi niya, eh, si Estrada daw ay uh, tumanggap ng milyon-milyon sa pwedeng operations. So because of that, there was uh, an impeachment case that uh, was instituted against Estrada. So uh, naging complicated yung impeach case, impeachment case kasi hindi natuloy yun. Uh, may uh, drama ng walkout. So bakit nag-walk out ang mga prosecutor sa impeachment case? Dahil daw uh, hindi binuksan yung envelope na hinihingi nilang buksan. And that envelope ay naglalaman daw ng uh, kayamanan ni Estrada. So uh, hindi natuloy yung impeachment case. So instead na gumapang yung impeachment case ay yung gumapang ay yung EDSA II revolution. So Estrada called for, uh, things became complica complicated in that uh, situation or in that instance wherein uh, Estrada called some uh, press conference at Malacanang, tapos umalis siya sa Malacanang, tapos sabi niya, babay. So according to the uh, Supreme Court, considering the uh, things that happened at yung pinakita ni Estrada, he is deemed to have resign from the office. <clears throat> Let's go to the different powers of the uh, president of the uh, Philippines under the constitution. So first of the uh, powers that is given to the uh, president is the appointment power. So under Section 14 of the uh, Article 7 of the 1987 Constitution, appointments extended by the acting president shall remain effective unless revoked by the elected president within 90 days from his assumption or reassumption. But what is this appointment all about? Appointment is defined as the unequivocal act of designating or selecting uh, by one having the authority, therefore, of an individual to discharge and perform the duties and functions of an office or trust. So to explain this further, we will be going to the case of Flores versus Brillion. What happened in this case? There was a law known as Republic Act 7227, entitled the Basis Conversion and uh, Development Act of 1992. So section 13 
of this uh, law provides that the uh, first year of the operation of the uh, SBMA from the effectivity of this of this law the mayor of the uh, city of Olongapo shall be appointed as a chairperson of SBMA so I repeat ah medyo conflicting kasi ang nakalagay sa batas na ito nakalagay sa section 13 na sino ba ang appointing authority o ad, ng uh, chairperson or administrator ng uh, subic authority nakalagay doon na it is a president who will appoint but nakalagay din sa batas na sa kanyang first operation ang i-appoint ay dapat yung mayor ng Bulongapo pwede ba yon so according to the supreme court mukhang may mali sa provision ng batas na yon so when the law provides the mayor of Olongapo shall be appointed as the chairman and chief executive officer of the subic authority it denied the president of his authority to pick his own choice to be the uh, chief executive officer of the subic authority that is because as a rule dapat may complete freedom ang ating president na mamili hindi yung dekahon na okay ang inyong appoint ay yung mayor ng uh Olonga po no so that portion of uh, republic act 7227 declaring that the mayor of uh Olonga po shall be appointed as the chair chairperson of the uh, subic authority was declared unconstitutional Let's go to the case of Bermudez versus uh, Executive Secretary. This involves the uh, two contenders in the position of a provincial prosecutor in the province of Tala. Ang nakalagay kasi sa batas, <clears throat> who must be appointed as the provincial prosecutor? Ang dapat na maka-appoint ay yung recommend ng DOJ secretary and actually appointed by the president. Okay? So before the president will appoint, there must be a recommendation from the secretary of justice. What happened there is there are two persons involved by the name of Bermudez and Kiawit. Sabi ng secretary ng, uh, ng uh, uh, Department of Justice, itong si Bermudez ang i-recommend ko. But ang ginawa ng ating president, President Ramos, during that time, binaliwala niya yung recommendation ng secretary of Department of Justice at pili pinili niya si Kiawit as the uh, prosecutor of the uh, province of Tarlac. So the issue here is, pwede bang baliwalain ng ating president ang recommendation ng kanyang secretary and he is going by his own to select a person by his own without regard to the recommendation of the secretary? To tell you, yes. The power to appoint by the president is in essence discretionary he has the right the president has a right of choice which he is going to if which is going to appoint kaya pwede niyang i-consider o hindi i-consider yung recommendation ng secretary of justice in this case let's go to the control power <clears throat> So, control means the president shall have the control of all the executive departments, bureaus, and offices. And he shall ensure that laws 
be faithfully executed. So <clears throat> let's go to the case of Luxon Magallanes uh, versus Panio. What happened in this case? The Secretary of Agriculture and uh, Natural Resources questioned the authority of the Executive Secretary in reversing the decision on the ground of equal rank. So, ang naging issue lang dito ay, may decision ang Secretary ng Agriculture and Natural Resources. Ang ginawa ng Executive Secretary, reverse niya o pinalitan niya ang decision ng Secretary na yon. Kaya nag-complain yung Secretary ng Agriculture. Sabi niya, Ikaw, Executive Secretary, bakit mo binago ang aking decision? E parehas lang naman tayo na Secretary. I am a Secretary of Agriculture and Natural Resources. You are the Executive Secretary. So, can the Executive Secretary change the decision of other Secretaries? Ano ang sabi ng Supreme Court during in this case? Sabi ng Supreme Court, yes. The Executive Secretary acting on behalf of the President may change the decision of other Secretaries. So, <clears throat> let's go to the case of De Leon versus Carpio. What happened in this case? So, Francis, uh, Francisco Estabilio and uh, Cesar De Leon were dismissed from the NBI. The Secretary of Justice Ordones ordered, however, that this NBI employees will be uh, reinstated. But ang director ng NBI ayaw niya. So, I repeat that, there were two NBI uh, employees who were removed. Sabi ng uh, Secretary of Justice, ibalik nyo ang dalawang empleyado na yan. Pero sabi ng director ng NBI, ayaw ko. So, the issue in this case is, may the director of NBI disobey the order of the Secretary of Justice. So, ano ang sabi ng Supreme Court? No. The Director of National Bureau of Investigation may not disobey the order of the Secretary of Justice. So, organizational structure kasi ng NBI, ang NBI ay hawak ng Department of Justice. No? Kaya kung ano ang decision ng Secretary of Justice, kailangan na respetuhin yan ng Director ng NBI. Let's go to the military power. <clears throat> so, the president is the commander-in-chief of all armed forces of the Philippines. As such, he is required to perform the following. So first, to call out uh, such armed forces to prevent or suppress lawless violence, invasion, or rebellion. Second is uh, to suspend the uh, privilege of the writ of habeas corpus and to place the Philippines or any part thereof under martial law. So, what happened in the case of Luxon versus Perez? On uh, May 1, 2001, President JMA issued proclamation, proclamation number uh, 38 declaring that uh, there is a state of rebellion in the uh, national capital region. Said proclamation was issued when an angry and violent mob uh, armed with explosives ay uh, sinugod ang Malacanang. So some claim that it is it's a three revolution nung sinugod ang Malacanang during the time of uh, GMA. So the president also issued general order number one 
directing the AFP and PNP to suppress rebellion in the uh, national capital region. So uh, warrantless arrest and several uh, of uh, several leaders of uh, the rallies <clears throat> were conducted. Yung pag-issue ni President GMA ng proclamation number 38 and general order number one was questioned, okay? So, tama ba ang pag-issue ng proclamation number 38 and general order number one na ito? So, according to the uh, Supreme Court, the rallies or the petitioners were not correct. Ang president daw ng, ng Pilipinas, as the commander-in-chief, has the intelligence network. May kakayahan siya na mag-gather ng kung ano-anong information that are classified as high confidential and others that may affect the state. So, because of this, the president, when it becomes necessary, may call out the armed forces to prevent or suppress any lawless violence, invasion, or rebellion. So let's go to the pardoning power. <clears throat> this is the most uh, discussed with respect to the criminology parlance, this pardoning power of the president. So it is known as a pardoning power, but there are several prerogatives that are enumerated here. It is the power of the president to grant reprieves, commutation, and pardons, and pardon, uh, remit fines and forfeitures, and even he may grant amnesty with concurrence of Congress. So this is the pardoning power of the president. So I repeat, what are included? It includes pardon, amnesty, reprieve, suspension of sentence, commutation, and remission of fines and forfeitures. So let's go to the case of Torres versus Gonzalez. So what happened in this case is there was a person who was given uh, pardon by the president. Sabi ng uh, president, okay, bibigyan kita ng pardon <clears throat> with, one condition, with one condition na huwag na huwag kang gagawa ng krimen uli or else I am going to cancel the pardon that is given to you. So in other words, it is a conditional pardon. And I repeat, the condition is for him not to commit crime again. So nung napalaya ang tao na yan because of pardon, nasampahan siya ng kaso afterwards. No? Nung nalaman ng office of the president na nasampahan siya ng kaso, binawi yung pardon that was previously given. So ang palusot ng tao ito ay office of the president, bakit ninyo binawi yung pardon na binigay niyo sa akin? eh hindi naman napatunayan yung criminal case na sinampa sa akin ngayon. Kailangan na hintayin ninyo na nandyan ang final judgment of conviction sa aking kaso ngayon bago nyo bawiin yung conditional pardon. Tama ba yung tao na yun? So according to the Supreme Court, mali. There is no need for the office of the president to wait for final judgment or final determination of the guilt of that person before revoking the conditional pardon that was previously given. So in ulit ko ah, kung may nabigyan ng pardon at ang condition ng pardon na yan ay hindi siya gagawa ng krimen ulit. Afterwards, ay nakasuhan siya ng crime. Kailangan bang hintayin ng office of the president 
na makonvict siya sa crime na yon bago uh, bawiin yung conditional pardon. According to the Supreme Court, in the case entitled Torres versus Gonzalez, hindi kailangan hintayin ang judgment of conviction. Kung sa tingin ng Office of the President ay na-violate yung condition ng pardon, then that pardon ay pwedeng bawiin o pwedeng i-revoke. <clears throat> so comes now the Tarla case entitled Yamas versus Orbos. What happened in this case is <clears throat> my governor during the time of President uh, <clears throat> Corazon Aquino. There was a uh, governor of uh, Tarlac who was charged with uh, violating Republic Act 3019, also known as the Anti Graft and Corrupt Practices Act. Why? Kasi ang governor na yan ay nakipag uh, uh, load contract sa isang non government. Uh, organization which was grossly manifestly disadvantageous to the province of Tarlac. Ibig sabihin yung governor nakipag loan contract sa isang uh, uh, non-government organization tapos nalugi masyado ang province of Tarlac because of that. So the uh, penalty that was uh, given to that governor was 90 days suspension. I repeat, uh, 90 days suspension. During the suspension, uh, during the suspension, the governor was able to convince the president of the Philippines na hindi siya na kinabang sa loan transaction na yon. Kaya, sabi ng uh, president ng Pilipinas, okay, I am giving you commutation. Babawasan ko ang penalty mo. Imbes na 90 days suspension, bibigyan na lang kita ng 30 days suspension. Diyan na nagka-problema. Kasi ang question ay, pwede bang magbigay ang ating president ng commutation in an administrative case? So, the Supreme Court, yes. The president may, may grant commutation or executive clemency in the administrative case. Ang ibig sabihin ng commutation ay babawasan ang penalty okay? or lessen the penalty. Can the president do that in administrative case? Yes. So commutation is not applicable only to criminal case. It is also applicable to administrative case. Let's go to the borrowing power, which is commonly abused. May the president borrow money outside on behalf of the uh, Republic of the Philippines? To tell you, yes. But there are two conditions that he must comply. And that is first, there must be a prior concurrence of the monetary board and subject to limitations provided by law. Let's go to treaty power. <clears throat> so the treaty power states that the president may enter into treaty with other states. No treaty, however, or international agreement shall be uh, valid and effective unless concurred by at least two thirds vote of all members of the Senate. So next is the budgetary power, which is the uh, power uh, of the president to, uh, okay, the budgetary power states that the uh, president shall submit to the Congress within 30 days from the opening of every regular session as a basis of the general appropriations bill a budget of expenditures and uh, resources of financing, including receipts from uh, existing and proposed revenue measures. 
Next is we have the informing power known as a sauna. So in every fourth Monday of July, <clears throat> the president is uh, conducting his state of the uh, nation address. And that is known as the informing power. Next is the takeover power. In times of national emergency, when uh, public interest so requires, the uh, president may, during the emergency and under reasonable terms prescribed, temporarily take over or direct operation of any private owned public utility or business affected with public interest. However, the president has the absolute authority of this power in the absence of emergency powers. Uh, so, ang ibig sabihin nito ay pwedeng mag-take over ang ating president ng private uh, entities provided <clears throat> na may emergency power siya na naipasa ng ating Congress. Comes now the case of Professor Randolph David versus GMA. Uh, <clears throat> si GMA, noong uh, 20th uh, anniversary celebration ng uh, EDSA People Revolution Part 1, nag-issue siya ng isang proclamation that is uh, proclamation number uh, 1017 declaring that there is a state of emergency. So, nakalagay na nandyan ang state of emergency kaya pwede ko nang i-take over ang ibang businesses affected with national interest dahil sa emergency na ito. Pwede ba yon? Pwede bang sasabi ng ating president na ito ang state of emergency kaya pwede ko nang i-take charge o i-take over ang mga uh, businesses na yan. According to the Supreme Court, no, the president cannot do that because like of what we have discussed, kailangan na, ang, kailangan na bago i-take over ang private institutions na yan o private businesses, dapat na may emergency power that was passed by Congress. Yan ang wala sa kaso na ito. There is no emergency power that was passed by the Congress authorizing the president to uh, take over those businesses. So let's go to the veto power. We have discussed this veto power when we have discussed the legislative branch of the government because how may a bill become a law? Isn't it that we have discussed that when the bill will reach the table of the president, there are uh, several things that may happen there. And one of the things that may happen there is the president may veto the bill. Ibabalik niya ang bill uh, sa uh, chamber ng Congress kung saan nanggali ang, nanggaling ang bill na yon. And that is known as a veto power. Can the veto power of the president be overridden by the chamber of the uh, Congress where that bill originate? So to tell you, yes, pwedeng, ma -over, pwedeng matalo ang veto power na ito by the two-thirds vote of the chamber where the uh, bill originated. No? And let's go to the residual power. So the 11th function or the 11th power of the president is the residual power, which is the power of the president in balancing the general welfare and the, and the common good against the exercise of rights of certain individual. So residual power ang tawag doon. To explain this residual power, <clears throat> we will be going to the case of Ferdinand Marcos et al. versus uh, Raul Manglapos. <clears throat> Alam natin lahat na 
after the Edsoban Revolution, uh, former President Marcos and his family members went to Hawaii. <clears throat> so during that time, the uh, former President Marcos was still alive. He asked the Aquino administration na kung pwede lang ay babalik siya dito sa Pilipinas. But ayaw ng Aquino, Admi Aquino administration na pabalikin si Marcos during that time. According to uh, President Aquino, in the interest of safety and for the tranquility of the state and order of society, the uh, remains of uh, Ferdinand Marcos will not be allowed to brought here in the Philippines. Nung namatay na si, Fern si uh, uh, Ferdinand Marcos. So, ibig sabihin, bago namatay si Marcos, hanggang siya ay namatay, gustong gusto ng family ng Marcos na bumalik dito sa Pilipinas but ayaw ng uh, kasalukuyang president during the time by the name of uh, Aquino. So, ang issue dito ay, pwede bang pilitin ng Marcos ang administrasyon Aquino na bumalik ang kanilang pamilya, uh, uh, family of Marcos dito sa Pilipinas? To tell you, the uh, act of President Aquino sa hindi niya pagpayag na bumalik ang Marcos dito sa Pilipinas ay naaayon daw sa kanyang residual power. Kaya valid daw yun. So, according to the Supreme Court, after the Edsawan Revolution, the nation was divided and it was hard or burdensome on the part of the current president. He is to, uh, the Supreme Court is talking about President Aquino in this case. To unite the nation, if the former president will be given the opportunity to return to the Philippines. So in other words, the current president exercised he, her residual power in prohibiting the return of the uh, Marcos family here in the Philippines. Kaya, naaayon daw, I repeat, sa residual power ng ating president kung ayaw niyang payagan na bumalik ang mga Marcos dito sa Pilipinas. Let's go to the judicial branch of the government. The judicial branch of the government is stated under uh, Article 8 of the 1987 Constitution. So, in Article 8 of the 1987 uh, Constitution, it uh, states there the judicial power. The judicial power is consisted of two. First, the duty of the courts of justice to settle actual controversy, controversies involving rights which are legally demandable and enforceable. And second is to determine whether or not there has been a grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction on the part of any branch or instrumentality of the government. So these are the two aspects of judicial power. May tinatawag lang tayo na expanded jurisdiction. So why is it that it is known as expanded jurisdiction? Expanded because it expanded the original jurisdiction of the judiciary. The first jurisdiction or authority of the judiciary is yung first phrase nito, and that is to settle actual controversies involving rights which are legally demandable and enforceable. So, dinidesisyonan ng ating courts ang mga karapatan that can be uh, that has a basis uh, to be demanded or for or to be enforced. But this is the original provision of the judicial power under the 1973 Constitution. 
But under the 1987 Constitution, dinagdagan pa niya ng tinatawag natin na expanded jurisdiction, which is the power to determine kung ang isang ahensya ng government ay inabuso niya ang kapangyarihan niya o hindi. So that is the expanded jurisdiction. So, pa o kailan makikialam ang ating courts sa ibang branches ng ating government or offices ng ating government? Makikialam ang ating courts kung nandyan yung tinatawag natin na grave abuse of discretion. In every office or agency of the government, they have the capability to use their discretion. So we all know that discretion is a wise use of one's judgment. If the use of that discretion was gravely, gravely abused, then the court can uh, intervene and they can declare that that is a grave abuse of discretion and that is unconstitutional and they cannot do so. So, dyan na lumabas yung tinatawag natin na judicial supremacy. Kaya may nagsabi na, oops, teka lang, there is already judicial supremacy. Because if you will just imagine that, ang courts natin ay pwede niyang sabihin na legislative, mali ang ginawa mo, hindi mo pwedeng gawin yan. Executive, mali ang ginawa mo, hindi mo pwedeng gawin yan. So, pwede bang sabihin natin na mas mataas na ang ating judiciary kaysa sa ating legislative and executive because the judiciary, the judiciary can declare that the acts of the legislative and executive are not in accordance with law, so invalid. So, according to the Supreme Court, may judicial supremacy ba? <laughs> to tell you, wala. Okay? There is no such thing as judicial supremacy. When the judiciary invalidates an action performed by other departments, it is not asserting any supremacy over other departments. In Tagalog, kung sinasabi ng ating Supreme Court na ikaw legislative, ikaw, uh, judi ay, ikaw legislative, ikaw executive, mali ang ginagawa mo. Hindi daw ina-assert ng ating judiciary ang kanyang supremacy. Hindi daw nangangahulugan na mas mataas ang judiciary. It is only performing its duty is specifically enjoined or stated by the Constitution as part of a system of checks and balances. So, <clears throat> let's go to taxpayers' suit. So, uh, in taxpayer suit, every taxpayer has the capability <clears throat> to question if there is a public funds that are illegally disbursed. Kaya kung sa tingin niyo ay may pondo ng ating government na illegally disbursed, then any taxpayer can question the same. So this taxpayer suit is uh, best illustrated in the case entitled Tatan versus Garcia. What happened in this case? In 1989, the uh, DOTC planned to construct a uh, railway <clears throat> along EDSA. So uh, it was uh, the construction was given to a corporation, a foreign corporation that siya na ang mag-construct sa railway na yon. But there are some senators by the name of Francisco Tatan, Osmeña, and Biason who question the constitutionality ng agreement na yon. So ang issue dyan ay, senators sila, may capability ba sila na questioning 
yung construction ng railway project na yon na naibigay sa isang foreign corporation. So, according to the Supreme Court, yes, they have the capability to say, to question that, and that is known as taxpayer's suit. So, the prevailing doctrine in taxpayer's suit is to allow taxpayers to question contracts entered into by the national government or government-owned or controlled corporations. So, aside from taxpayer suit, may tinatawag tayo na moot case. But to be complete, ang usual na tawag nila sa moot case na ito ay moot and academic case. Dito applicable yung kasabihan ng Pilipino na aanhin mo ang damo kung patay na ang kabayo. So in other words, a moot case is when a judgment or on cannot have any practical legal effect or the nature of it cannot be enforced. Ibig sabihin, aanhin natin ang kaso na yan. If we are going to decide what will happen next? So, <clears throat> the best illustration of this moot case is in the case of uh, Fernando Co. Jr. versus GMA. We discussed this a while back. Diba? Si GMA at si Fernando Co. tumakbo sila with, uh, as presidents way back, as president way back 2004. Nung, uh, after the 2004 presidential election, na i-declare uh, na nanalo si GMA. Nag-protest ngayon si uh, nag-protest na ngayon si Fernando Po. Kaya may election protest that was filed under the Presidential Electoral Tribunal. So uh, si Fernando Po nung hindi pa natapos ang taon na 2004, namatay siya. Kaya si Susan Roses Gusto niya, siya na ang mag-substitute sa election protest na sinampa ng kanyang mister. Pwede ba yon? According to the uh, rules of uh, Presidential Electoral tri Tribunal, only the second and third placer can question. Tapos walang nakalagay na rule on uh, substitution or intervention. So, tulad ng sabi ko kanina, Nung namatay si Fernando Po, pati ang kaniyang protest, namatay din. Hindi pwedeng mag-substitute ang kaniyang misis. So that is a classic example of moot and academic case. Let's go to Lucas Standi. <clears throat> Lucas Standi is defined as the right of appearance in a court of justice in a given question. In private suit, uh, locus standing is governed by the real party in interest. So, bago ang isang tao ay mag-file ng kaso, siya ay dapat na real party in interest. Dapat na affected siya sa kaso na yun. Except, however, of what we have discussed in relation to taxpayer suit. No? Kasi ang taxpayer suit may, may allegedly na ginasto illegally ng ating government from taxes. So, any taxpayer can question it. But what if there is no tax that is involved? So, that case may be filed only by person if they have the locus standing or if they have the uh, if they are the real parties in interest in that case. So, to illustrate this locus standi, we will be discussing Pimentel versus House of Representatives Electoral Tribunal. If you record our discussion as to the composition of Electoral Tribunal before, diba? the Electoral Tribunal is consisted of two. We have the Senate Electoral Tribunal and we have the House of Representatives Electoral Tribunal. What is the composition? There must be three coming from these justices of the Supreme Court, and there must be six 
kung Senate Electoral Tribunal yan, six senators. Kung House of Representatives Electoral Tribunal, dapat na members ng House of Representatives. So, what happened there is, yung mga senators, okay, let's go to the Commission on Appointments. The composition of Commission on Appointments is the ex officio chairperson is the president of the Senate. And there must be 12 senators and 12 congressmen. Ang question ng mga senators dito, bakit sa House of Electoral Tribunal at sa Commission on Appointments, bakit hindi sila represented? Ay bakit hindi represented ang mga party list? Bakit daw walang party list? So, ang nag-question doon, I repeat, mga senators. Can the senators question that? Bakit walang party list representation sa electoral tribunal at commission on appointments? O ano ang sabi ng Supreme Court? Walang legal personality ang mga, ang mga uh, senators na questionin yun because in the first place, they are not affected. No? So they are not affected. So, the senators who are petitioners in this case have no legal personality to question the non-inclusion of party list representatives to the House of Representatives Electoral Tribunal and Commission on Appointments. So, <clears throat> let's go to the classification of the powers of the Supreme Court. If you are going to read the uh, powers of the uh, Supreme Court in the Constitution, napakadaming nakalagay doon na powers. No? Napakadaming nakinumerate dyan na powers ng Supreme Court. So, we will just be facilitating the uh, discussion in this way. We will be discussing the uh, powers by clumping them into two. We have the judicial powers and we have the auxiliary or the uh, administrative powers. So <clears throat> let's go to the, uh, by the way, we, we will be discussing some powers later on. No? We, will be, we will first be going to the composition of the Supreme Court. So, the Supreme Court shall be composed of uh, uh, a Chief Justice and 14 Associate Justices. It may sit and bank. When we say and bank, uh, it is the meeting of the Supreme Court na nandyan ang uh, Chief Justice at nandyan yung lahat ng 14 Associate Justices. So the opposite of end bank is division. No? So it may sit end bank or in its discretion in the division of three, five, or seven members. <clears throat> so ano ang qualifications ng um, uh, members ng Supreme Court? So the qualifications of the members of the Supreme Court is as usual, the natural born citizens of the uh, Philippines, at least 40 years of age, and uh, for 15 years or more, a judge of lower court or engaged in the practice of law in the uh, uh, Philippines. So, how about the uh, uh, Court of Appeals? Ito ang kanilang, uh, ito ang kanilang uh, qualifications. We have the uh, uh, is still natural born citizen. Uh, in other words, the qualifications of the uh, members of the Supreme Court is uh, the same with the qualifications of the uh, members of uh, Court of Appeals. We have the qualifications of the uh, judges of the uh, RTC, just read them, at least 35 years of age and 10 years practice of law. And uh, in uh, the judges of uh, the first level courts is uh, we have the uh, at least 30 years of age and uh, five years engaged in the practice of law. 
So let's go to the uh, case of uh, Cayetano versus uh, Munson. This involves uh, during that. This involves a case during the time of uh, Corazon, Corazon Aquino. <clears throat> See, uh, Corazon Aquino. He uh, appointed <clears throat> Christian uh, Munson for the position of. Uh, Camelec chairman. At ang isa na requirement sa uh, for a person to be appointed as uh, the chairman or member of uh, Camelec is he must be involved in the practice of law. According to Cayetano, however, si Monso daw ay hindi na involved sa Abogado siya, pero hindi siya na-involve sa practice of law. Hindi siya nag-practice sa loob ng court. Okay? So sabi ni Cayetano, Munso disqualified ka. You cannot be appointed as Camelic chairperson because you were not involved in a practice of law. Hindi ka pumasok sa court to practice, uh, to perform, or to represent a case in court. So, sabi ng Supreme Court, qualified si Monson because practice of law is not limited to conduct of cases in court. It includes any other activity in or out of court which requires application of law, legal procedure, knowledge, training, and experience. Let's go to a case entitled uh, the Judicial Bar Council or the JBC versus Judge Kintin. See, si Judge Kintin, I uh, <clears throat> na appoint na judge ng Regional Trial Court. But bago siya ma appoint na judge ng uh, Regional Trial Court, siya pala ay na dismiss na empleyado ng government. So, na-dismiss siya dahil sa isang administrative case. So, hindi siya naging honest. Nung na-recommend siya for the position of regional trial court judge, hindi niya sinabi yun na nahimik siya. Hindi niya sinabi na siya ay dating empleyado ng government at na-dismiss dahil sa administrative case. So, hindi alam ng ating president yun, siya ang na appoint na judge ng regional trial court. Kaya ang issue dito ay may integrity ba si Judge Kintin to become a judge? So, sabi ng Supreme Court, he does not have that integrity. A judge who did not disclose that he was previously charged and dismissed from the service for grave misconduct does not possess the requirement of integrity as a member of the judiciary. So let's go to the judicial, judicial and bar council. <clears throat> this is the composition of the judicial and bar council. It has a chairman and the chairperson of the JBC, the judicial and bar council is the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So he is an ex officio. He is automatic chairperson of the Judicial and Bar Council. At yung ex officio members ay Secretary of Justice and a representative of Congress. So dalawa ang ex officio members ng Judicial and Bar Council. We have the Secretary of Justice and the uh, representative from Congress. And we have the regular members. Uh, who are they? Representative of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, a professor of law, a retired member of the Supreme Court, and a representative of the uh, private sector. So they are the regular members. And the Secretary of the Judicial and Bar Council is, a, is the clerk of the Supreme Court. So the clerk of the Supreme Court is ex officio secretary of the Judicial and Bar Council, and he shall keep a record of proceedings of the council. 
ano ang functions ng judicial and bar council na ito? So, first of the functions is uh, to recommend appointees to the judiciary. So, from judges up to the uh, up to the members of the Supreme Court, sila ang nag-recommend. So, the members of the Supreme Court and judges of the lower courts shall be appointed by the President. From a list of three nominees prepared by the Judicial and Bar Council for every vacancy. And there's no need for their confirmation. Ibig sabihin, hindi, naka, hindi kinakonfirm ng Commission on Appointments ang appointments ng judges and members ng Supreme Court. So, the President shall issue the uh, appointments within 90 days from the submission of the list. So, second function of the uh, Judicial and Bar Council is uh, to exercise other functions and duties that may be assigned by the Supreme Court in it. Okay, so that's all. This, uh, this will form part of the uh, part four of our uh, discussion and um, it will be immediately uploaded and uh, please uh, study it uh, together with your books if you have your books and we will be scheduling a uh, recitation, okay? Perhaps this week or next week, okay? Thank you, thank you.